uh, this is Jim Freund, and uh, with me is Nicole Glover. Uh, you, you, do you say Glover or Glover? How do you uh, how do you properly pronounce? It's Glover. It's it is Glover. So I beg your pardon. Okay. So, how, how does the actor pronounce his name? It's Glover as well. At least that's how I always heard of it. The most most people are that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, it doesn't rhyme with Clover. Nicole Glover has a debut novel out, uh, which you just saw the cover of. Uh, but if you're listening on the radio, you didn't see the cover. It's called The Conductors. And it is from Mariner Press. And it's got just a wonderful concept. I get, I don't know how many pitches and email a day, most of them totally inappropriate to what I do. And I did a double take on this one. It's like, oh, wait, this is spec fic. This is fascinating. And what a great premise. And so, and so here we are. Mm -hmm. uh, do, uh, can you give us a pre of what the conductors is about. Okay. It's it follows a pair of former underground railroad, railroad conductors who you know they spent their years you know uh, doing all the things of ferrying people from through slavery to freedom, doing some stuff in civil war, and this book takes place in 1871 Philadelphia, and so they're done with the war, is things putting their past behind them, settling down to new lives, and basically decide they take their skills and solve murder mysteries. And they thought they do that with you know this their general you know smarts and wits as well as magic because there's also in addition to murder in this world there's a bunch of magical mysteries to take care of. And so this book centers around the murder of a close friend that they, that they they discovered and they basically the, the book kind of details the fallout from this, seeing the the how the impact this death impacts their lives, their friends' lives, and well as the community and. And in addition to all that, it's then exploring the history of that time period with a fun level of you know the magic and murder sides to it as well. Yeah, yeah. As, so it's just it's got a perfect setting, an uh, underexplored setting until I guess there've been a couple. Uh, there was the movie Harriet, uh, and uh, with a twenty dollar bill to come, and uh, the. There was one, was it the Free State of Jones? Was It wasn't about the railroad, but it was. Yeah, it's about those. I don't. I didn't watch it, but I know I looked up the history from it when I, when I saw the trailer for it. And it's basically, they make a, their own, it's during Civil War. I think you know, they think the guy in charge who, who founded it was a former Confederate soldier who said, this basically decided he didn't want to do anything more involved with it. So it basically makes his own town basically, with people of all race, different races and stuff like that. And, yeah, but... Yeah, and it's actually a pretty good movie. It was better than I had expected it yeah. to be. Um, so the setting is, as far as popular media is concerned, mm -hmm. an underexplored one mm -hmm. uh, on an era and a fact of these of America, I want to say United States, that, that uh, is mostly denied. Certainly nothing like what I was taught in school mm -hmm. uh, right. since I went to, uh, yeah. to elementary school in the 1960s. It was a very different history than mm -hmm. one that I know now. I probably it probably hasn't changed that much when I when I was in school. The Reconstruction era was probably like a paragraph, a page, if I'm being generous. No, and yeah, then, except that you know they added that Andrew Jackson was a good guy. Some of the books still are still like that. <laughs> At least I remember from when I was in school. It's it's yeah, it's, it, it depends where you go basically, and probably some of them probably they're about the same. Things some I think there's an attempt to make them better is with anything, but it's you don't know. It's hard to say. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't have any kids in school, right? I don't have kids. So I don't know what they're teaching, right? These kids today, basically. Yeah. But the internet's really helpful, though, because 
it's interesting as I gotten like you know, logged into social media and stuff, even seeing people like figuring out pieces of history that like basically you no know, people say like learn today that these blog posts basically being like they learn these certain facts and social media allows at least things that aren't really covered in school can be kind of blown up on the internet and gets people interested to do their own research because everything's still out there still out there just not it's really hard to find yeah and and, and the internet does um provide conversation the problem is is that of course without a good mediator uh, an editor of some kind, uh, you get so much of the bad mm -hmm. along with the good, as we know all too well. Yeah. And uh, so people still have to do their own research. But add to that era, add to that, that as I say, under uh, popularized, is that the word I want? Untold stories. Mm -hmm. Uh, add to that mystery and magic. Mm. And it seems like a great combination. Oh, yeah, it was. It, yeah. It just wonderful. kind of came together. Like it was, I got this idea randomly. It was like, just worked really well. I don't know, it was just, this is something different. I think because I don't really see too many uh, media that's pop, at least popular, that's 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 specifically stated after the Civil War. You might get little post Civil War flashback and epilogue on these stories, but a lot of the, particularly with with Black history, it's that 19th century. It's going to be antebellum. It's going to be Civil War. You're not going to really see Reconstruction era as much, and and mm -hmm. anything, especially especially for fairly close after Civil War. And I think the only thing in depth I remember seeing is probably like the old roots series mini series and then they have a sequel the next generation yeah and they that covers like you know the post civil war to i guess to the 70s when the author i guess the end of the author basically starting to write the original book but that was probably like one of the few pieces of media that at least i was able to find easily there's probably a few other ones probably some tv movies out there that are specifically set in that time period but there's not there's not really it's not a all the big move, big Hollywood movies, big TV shows aren't gonna aren't in that time period, which leads to a lot of like it's it's a lot of untold untold stories, and a lot of interesting things came in because when I started writing, I just found a lot of interesting things like just in the few years, like the in the 1870s, there's like so much stuff going on that I didn't include all of it in the book because I was focusing on just the lives of the characters instead of like the the larger world, but there's a lot of things going on. It's interesting. It's and so much is all across the country because it's like a it's like one thing i found in the research is like it's a very important time period and it's like so important that it's the stuff that's, that's written about that time period but by, by the writers of that decade is still relevant today yes like you just change names change the dates you can it's still very important it is it is and very much set the uh a lot of the time frame things going on today um, it's um uh I, I live in a particular part of brooklyn where not five blocks from me is a church that a uh, deconsecrated church that boasted that it served both ulysses s grant and robert e lee um, at the same time, and there were statues to that extent. Uh, the, those are gone, but within three miles of where I live, uh, they're totally rebuilding this uh, formerly rundown neighborhood, good commercial neighborhood near Fulton Street, and there's one huge pit there. It's mm -hmm. there. There could be and probably will be a you know 30, 40 story building. Mm -hmm. But there's this shack. And the reason the shack hasn't been developed is a stop on the Underground Railroad. Mm -hmm. And it's dilapidated, but the owners, uh, I think they've crowdfunded to hold on to that mm -hmm. and keep that. And the great wish is for that to be developed into a museum. Right. 
and there certainly needs to be one. Uh, uh, where, I'm not sure. New York was a pretty active place for the yeah. railroad. Uh, but it's the fact that in the last year, so especially since uh, the Black Lives Matter movement finally became a mainstream thing, People are questioning the statues there uh, on the Muppet Show on the Disney Channel. They put a disclaimer before Johnny Cash comes out and sings a song with a Confederate flag behind him. Oh, I didn't know that was. I guess that I, that didn't, I, I heard about they had put disclaimer on some of the episodes yet, but I hadn't got a chance to look at them yet. So I guess oh, it only came up last week. Yeah. And I uh, uh, and I saw I saw people can go to YouTube and see that particular clip. Yeah. And I think that if Johnny Cash were to do that today, he would rethink what was behind him. But it, it was it was just basically a whole lot of detritus. But the point is that what was going on then has become part of station. More so than it was, say, 10 years ago. And so that's a way of saying, I think uh, The Conductors is a book whose time has come. <laughs> also, funny. it seems very, it seems like there's a lot more than one story than this novel. And by the way, let me mention to people, um, I got the book last week. I finished it last week. It's a page turner. It's fun. You know, there's a lot of serious stuff going on, but it's still fun. That was my that was my main thing kind of going in there, especially when they have the magic in there. It has to be fun, at least for me for writing it. Uh-huh. So it's like it's I wanted to have a good I always have a, I guess that's how my approach for everything, like a mix of everything. It could be serious, but I like to have fun with my stuff. Yeah, and uh, so it seems to me, uh, I know that you're working on a sequel. Yeah, right? I just, sure, just turned that in. You did? Congratulations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, do they have a pub date on that? Right now, it's in November of this year. Wow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's great. It is. It is a good sign. I think it's always nice to have, you know, well, one one thing's nice to say, yeah, two books out in one year. It's always nice to say. And it's also short for readers, too. It shortens the time between books. I know. I know. And I know a lot of people like that as well. Yeah. We were, I, we were talking, I think, off air about how sometimes you want to not watch something on TV or something so that you can take it all in, especially the, you know, the first or the last episodes <laughs> in uh, a mini binge, a micro binge. Mm -hmm. Uh, and there are too many writers, Michael Moorcock coming to mind, Philip Jose Farmer, another, where you might get two or three years in between volume one and volume two. And with George Martin, it can be a decade. Yeah. Just about. Right. So that's great to have two books in one year. Do you have other tasks for your characters do you have other stories i always have i always have a bunch of story ideas it's always i always have a, i always keep a list of stuff of things that they're in like in the in the view of things i want to work on eventually or this thing is a lot of things as i did this research a lot of things captured my attention that i'd like to write about but it didn't fit in these in these two books that can i always had like a ton of stuff like i don't want to overstuff things so a lot of that stuff ends up being a file of things that'd be great to kind of build out and i have a few things i would want i would want to work on so it's like it just depends it's right now it's just the, it's the waiting it's a we'll see mode for the with these books so uh yeah will most of these involve hetty and benji yeah it's i've at least got two ideas for Two more, and it's a few other ones. Because I have a lot of fun with this world. And I think that one benefit to I mean, it's a mystery series. I also do a really short period of time because the first book is maybe just, was just over a week of time. So it's like, yeah, it's it's easy to kind of, it's there's lots, there's lots of room basically. It just depends, like, as long as I have the ideas for stuff, as long as I have the idea for a good murder. I always have really careful, like, building out the mystery <laughs> if it gets too complicated. 
<laughs> so I don't want to jinx anything by asking, but I mean, this does seem like an obvious series, doesn't it? Like, uh, like TV series or movie series or some such. I mean, there's, yeah, there's nothing really I can say at the moment there, but it's, yeah, no. it's always been my, yeah, you, uh, you have anything if you want to see your book turned in with actual actors and stuff in there. So either a movie or a TV series. I mean, I can easily see a movie being like a, you know, just following the book and the TV series taking more of the concepts mm -hmm. and like, you know, it's building out individual murders per year episodes with an overarching thing. But, you know, yeah. it's, so I guess most, I, most I also like, I think I dabbled at one point that like messing around with TV scripts. So I got thinking like how would a TV script be the, the how would I would do a TV adaptation mostly because I was thinking, you know, it's just, just thinking as you know, big dreams, that sort of thing. Now you have an audio book from this, don't you? Yes, yeah, so the audio book be coming out the same same day as the book, I, I believe. So Did which you? is exciting too, because I got into into audio books really in a big way in the past two or three years. Mm -hmm. I wasn't really, I mean, I always knew about audiobooks, but it wasn't like, I'm going to go to audiobooks as, you know, as to my primary way to read, read a book. But I think I, just, I, kept, I, looked, I found a, a couple of books that had really good narrators. And I was like, some of them, there are actually some books that I just always listened to because, listen to the audiobook only because the narrator for that series is so good. It's like, it's better than reading the book itself. Or there's some things I know that's going to be more fun with the audiobook. It's, so, so I'm so always excited to hear that there is an audio book with my book because it's like, you know, it's one of those little things. Well, um, uh, we have to do disclosure. Uh, pretty much anything that John Joseph Adams, and he's the editor on this book, correct? Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, any uh, anything that he does will generally have an audio book, often done by Skyboat Media. And full disclaimer is that I work for John Joseph Adams as an audio editor. So uh, he uh, he has three fiction magazines, Nightmare Magazine, Lightspeed Magazine, and Fantasy Magazine. And I am the audio editor on all three, and I'm the host of Lightspeed. And the narrators and uh, producers of these audio books are Skyboat Media, and they're narrators are just incredible uh who's the narrator on your book bonnie turpin i know that name she's 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 she's, she's pretty much on every book i've listened to on your book a lot, a lot of recently nearly always be our narrator which i was really so i was really excited to see her name pop up as a potential person for it when they they're when they were auditioning the narrators so I haven't listened. I haven't heard. I only heard like a, the preview snippet she did. Mm -hmm. But so, so, but, and so I know she probably, she did not, knowing her, she probably did an outstanding job. So I can't wait to get a chance to listen to it. Yeah. So that, that in a way is already the second, it's your words, but then her voices. And it's almost, even though an audio book hues exactly to what you've written, it is sort of an adaptation mm -hmm. depending on on the skill of the narrator definitely because yeah. some of them can make it like almost like a audio play but not a radio play basically like there's some of them especially when they do especially when they have the specific voices for the characters it's, it's, it's so much it can be almost seems just like a radio radio drama but other times the other narrators just kind of just reading the book <laughs> Which those are the less those are the audio books I kind of just go back to the the regular book. Well, <laughs> I, I told you off air that my beginning at age thirteen, uh, my very introduction to WBAI, and uh, uh, doing radio of any kind was watching Samuel R. Delaney creating a radio drama of his novella, The Star Pit. Mm -hmm. And uh, we don't have the facilities right now at WBAI for radio drama, but I myself have produced 50 or so, including one with Delaney that ran four hours. Um, it was a novella. And so for me, radio drama 
is my favorite form of adaptation because we do better special effects than anybody. It's the mind's eye, yeah. and that provides it all. But yeah, reading reading the conductors, I heard some of it as I was reading it in my head. I could just see, like, yeah, you're right. This could go for radio. Some of it could go for theater. Mm -hmm. I could imagine that. Um, but I, I would love to see this world um, in different places. But first and foremost, from your writing. Uh, what kind of research did this take? Uh, a lot. And in some ways, I'm still doing the, the research because there's so many, there's just so much out there that I can include things that this needs to know. And I think I, I mean, I did, I did like two kind of versions of it. One was more of a targeted research, and I specifically looked in Philadelphia in eighteen and eighteen seventies. Looked at mm -hmm. the people living that time period, and looked at specific things I referenced. Then I also took a broader view, going back as far as eight, early eighteen hundreds, throughout through, with, with this focus on the U.S. and getting this, following us all the antebellum period, looking into Civil War stuff and. Kind of again, from, from that big view, kind of narrowing down certain spots, especially when I reference certain things in the book. And yeah, just, just mostly just a lot, of the, a lot of the stuff ended up being just research for me to know what it's about. So I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so I have the foundation. Because I, I mean, from what I, I always have this philosophy that it's the, when it comes to a book with a book, most 10% of your research ends up, ends up in the book, maybe even, even less than that. But the rest of it's for you to know about. So you can kind of describe, have a good feeling of how the world is. And from that point, I, you know, I'd, I think I came across a lot of prime. I came across a few primary sources, did a lot of research into using like a JSTOR and all those databases that library provides. Looked at newspapers. Uh, yeah, made sure I, I found like I looked up old newspapers that were going on the time period and looked up and found like you know looked randomly picked up days and dates and like look at what articles looked like that time period. So what they're talking about basically. And you know, it's got a the lot heavy use of library, which I dug up a bunch of books from storage, made learned how to use interlibrary loan system, and got sent. I was really happy that I got like some some of the most random books I'd found there. Libraries got got them for me, wow. and and just a lot of some of the stuff was sometimes I would see stuff on the internet in passing that seems like interesting was a person or a certain thing, and I just go dig in from there. And, you know, it's, like I said, it still continues. I still come across stuff and it's like, oh, and I, sometimes I feel bad. Like maybe it should have gotten my book or why didn't I, maybe I didn't reference this. It means it's like, it's terrible. But at the same time, even though it's history, I had to remind myself that, you know, it's fantasy, I have magic in here. So I don't have to be hundred percent accurate for certain things. I can like lean on there's magic to be like kind of loose, to be hundred percent factual. That's a, that's a hard thing to remember sometimes, but at the same time, I want to make sure it's it's close to it. Because I mean, there's a reason I said it with it with with a history background. Because I mean, I easily could have made this like a secondary world where it's right. nothing besides a history, and but I made the choice to make it have it have the sort of the historical side into it. So I had to you know to keep as close to the history, real history as possible. Because that's I mean, that's that's the big, the big choice I made. That, that that was one of the uh, things that appealed to me uh, was how well set in our history in our world this is uh the the stuff that say nora jemison nk jemison does uh her world building is fabulous it's wonderful and it transports you and you learn greater truths in a way by taking a step away from reality but that's not quite the same as being able to set something in a credible world that is mostly part of our history, just with a few left turns taken here and there. Right. Well, uh, how did you determine what kind of magic you were going to invoke? Well, I one thing I was thinking of a magic system. I think when I was thinking of the main characters, I mean, 
I, I decided I was going to make my own magic system. I looked, and I looked at, you know, when I did my research, like, you know, looked at what other kind of magic systems were out there and also looked, you know, thought of like all the fantasy books I've read in the, in the past, like, what do I like about it? Do I want to have elemental magic? Do I want to do something else? Do I want wands? And I think eventually I decided I'm going to make my own thing. And I was like, you know, I liked, I like stars, I like astronomy, constellations, like, you know, let's, let's make a magic system based off of that. And so that's basically how the celestial magic, as I call in the book, came about. Mm -hmm. I wanted I want to invoke the stars. I use the constellations. And I like the idea of them drawing like sigils and working that sigils, whether it's in clothing or in artwork, that sort of things. And that's that's where I got to decide what the main characters did. And as a building off the world, I like the idea that everyone in the world has magic. And but magic kind of is, is different depending on their background, their nation, their ethnicity, their religion, where their country, or basically their background. It's, it's all different. It's the magic, everyone can do magic, but it's, it's, it shows up differently, like, kind of like arts. Like everyone has different styles and whatnot. And there's no, there's no limitations other than your, your time, your effort, and your creativity with the magic. So I came up with different magic systems. I, I only, I only had a couple, there was only a few others I meant to get specifically named the book, and I have the idea that there's others out there. The only other big one I'd mentioned is the sorcery, which is kind of Western Europe. It's the magic of white people. It's the typical wand making, uh, uh, calling out enchantments, and has all these rules. Where it makes the contrast to celestial magic, which is it's more loosely defined. Where it's just as long as you know the constellations, you can use any kind of spell. You can use, you can use, you know, you can use Earth and Major, Andromedia, Canis Minor, and make for the same kind of fire spell, light spells, whatever. But it's like whatever you want, you get whatever. It's, it's the only limit to your creativity with celestial magic. Whereas, and that's so uh, those are fun, interesting things to kind of work around with because it's like a another layer to kind of play around with how how the world interacts with magic and how can you feasibly make a world that's kind of like our own with magic in it. Because I don't know, I think I was growing up reading so many books where I guess fantasy is always limited to a small group of people. I always like the idea of like what happens if everybody has magic and what what's where's yeah. the what makes it fun. Where the, that's where that's a regular part of that world, yeah. As as opposed to like the Buffy verse or something, or the Scooby Gang or whatever, mm -hmm. where you have you know the five people, mm -hmm. uh, or even then you have two people with magic and three sidekicks, mm -hmm. and that's the group. Mm -hmm. And yes. then, and then they discover a big bad or a murder or something and have to deal with that. Although usually it's a big bad. And that's the other thing that appealed to me was the idea that you're putting mysteries in here. Yeah. Uh, uh, that you were crossing yet another genre mm -hmm. at the same time. Is, is it a fair guess, given the way you were describing magic, that you were uh, or are a big games player? Yeah, I... I I may play a fair amount of video games. Probably some of it more. Name names. Yeah. And name some. Um, I know some of like type of, some of like the old school or RPG games like Final Fantasy series. I think I was big into Kingdom Kingdom Hearts mm -hmm. when I was when I was younger. Um, I know the big one I'm playing right now is the new Hades game, which it's I mean, mostly on the Switch and Steam and stuff. It's like a I don't know, it's 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 a lot. Of, it's a, it's one of the that really well crafted game that I played in a really long time from like everything level from music, a gameplay, it's a design of the game system. It's Can it's a dictator. Hmm? Can you play solo or is it a uh yeah, it's, a solo. it's a solo game, yeah. Oh okay. Like, yeah, single so, player. Solo games are my favorite. Yeah, those yeah, I don't play a lot of those multi those multiplayer games because right? like oh like Overwatch and those things. It's just I don't know, it's just not as it's I want to play by myself. It is teamwork with other people is you know it's annoying. Plus a lot of times, you know, internet speeds be messing up with you. And yeah. I don't know, I just don't want anyone to mess my mess my groove up with these games. I, I only ever played one uh uh mass or whatever the, whatever these are called. Mm -hmm. And uh I'm not well versed in that part of the games. And I uh nowadays I mostly play yeah, uh, uh, like building a zoo, kind of. Mm -hmm. Planet Zoo is amazing, and Planet Coaster. But uh, it sounds trite. It's not. It's really complex stuff. I mean, I, yeah, no, I get that. I mean, that's there's a reason Animal Crossing is such like a, a big thing. 
and those other games like that. I think Stardew Valley and and there's some other ones like Harvest Moon. Stardew Valley, yeah. I like all those games. They have because it's like a that's there's a reason there's a those are really big because it's like a. I remember I, I, I saw an article a while ago talking about the four types of gamers and there's the gamers who like to you know create things like to make be social to like to make there's the game people who want to fight and there's of course people want to make achievements and yeah. those are they'll show up in those and those shows up in the pop and those kind of you can kind of attach a popular game to each one of those categories yeah i'm i'm pretty much the achievement type mm. i think you know there there can be a goal yeah. um so i always like the ultima games and uh, um, oh, which is the series that Skyrim is a part of, but uh, uh, and it's interesting to note how many science fiction writers have uh, and fantasy writers have come out from that. Na uh, Naomi Novik wrote Neverwinter Nights 2 before she wrote her first uh, fanfic, mm -hmm. started writing her profic. Mm -hmm. And uh, th those are very much my type of games. And I was sort of wondering if you could imagine uh, your – does your universe have an overall name? I, there's, I mean, there's a series name of Murder and Magic, but I don't know if it's, it's a world. I mean, it's, it's, I guess because it's, like, based off our, like, you know, our world with some tweaks to it. It's like it's hard to say. It's like it's like you know when you said like other like worlds of like you know other fantasy worlds. It's like yeah, it doesn't really have a definite name for other than what I have what the series been called. But yeah, so I'm I'm just wondering if that series of this concept, can you imagine that as a uh, game? Yeah, I know I know there are some Sherlock Holmes games. I remember I seen a while ago. So and there's a bunch of mystery games too. I think like the Phoenix Wright's Attorney games are kind of like mysteries. So I think, yeah, I mean, the other than the mysteries and there's also the magic gas, but yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I guess I'm a, I'm a firm believer. You can turn any story to any kind of, any kind of adaptation through any medium. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, execution, execution will vary, of course, but anything, anything can be done with any kind of genre. It's like, you know, if you pick enough time with it. So yeah, I, I, I mean, I also would personally love to see a video game for myself. I mean, I, I mean, I guess I would be honest, I would like to see my stuff in any kind of medium and it begin with, but mm -hmm. video games are kind of fun too. Cause it's like, you know, I, I, yeah, because I was—I think I had one point one to write, write to write to write stories for video games, and I mean, also with my job, I'm also interested in the UX to usability of video games too. So all that's interesting to me. So I mean, as game system, I could probably see something like the—I think there's an uh, Okami game. I think it's a the game with the fox and like the watercolor Japanese watercolor. And so I don't know. If, yeah, I, 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 I can I, see I, the magic being done like that and a system like that, and especially now since we're moving to more. Uh, not not uh, controller restricted games like you get have VR and you have like you know the stuff like the Wii and like you can make more elaborate motions with it. I can see that working well. No, just, yeah, I, I think VR version that would be very interesting, and that's something that's finally, finally, perhaps coming within our grasp. Our sophisticated. I've seen VR games and VR systems going back to a period before people thought such a thing could exist. I mean, the early 80s. Yeah. But, the, you know, there the game might be, there's a ball, see if you can move it. Yeah. And if you can, you've won the game. <laughs> it's gotten a little more sophisticated than that. And uh, it's, it's very interesting. Unfortunately, I have a pair of goggles that sit mm -hmm. somewhere, and I, like, never used it. Yeah, I haven't played any VR games yet. Mostly, I don't know. Mostly, as I'm always thinking, it's gonna mess up. I can't. I, a lot of visual stuff, especially with glasses, it doesn't always play nice. So it's like I don't want to get something, and I just find it, it's hard for me to see through it. And I don't know. But I do know it's like the next kind of next frontier with video games. I'm thinking more of immersive, like it, immersive stuff that's kind of blends between like a like a movie system and like a video game system, kind of like the. I guess something like the like Netflix attempts with a it's an interactive movie like that Battle Dash, Battle yeah. Dash thing, movie. I don't remember the name. Yeah, uh, attempts is a good do. word. I'm not sure how totally they may have succeeded mm -hmm. or not. I, I right. wasn't overly taken with it. Oh, no, I wasn't either. I just 
and there's lots of things I disliked from it, from some story stuff they had in there. I didn't get too far in it, but I think they had stuff like that was like really like, you know, have him throwing away his medication, which is like not a good thing to show young, young, impressive people because you no know, medication is good, especially when you have certain, certain things. But there's like a, but I guess from design wise, I mean, the concept wise, I, I always, I always hate the, the fourth wall knocking stuff. Like, you know, it's a, it's a movie about making games. It's like, it feels like a, I don't know, it's just a, it's too fourth wall for me. Like it's, it feels different topic, maybe more, it'd be more interesting, but I think it's a good attempt, I guess, of what we could do, of the potentialness with movies. I can see in the, in some far future, we have movies that are more custom built. Like you can go to these movie theaters and you can make your own decisions, like how you want it to be. Like, you know, if you want to be a, a rom-com, you want it to be like a, a more of a straight comedy, you want to be like a tragedy and action and stuff like that. It's like, there's, it's just, it's just it's just interesting the possibilities that we get more sophisticated ways we do film, we film stuff and with, with the computer science, you can make more tailored movies to, to each individuals, which I don't know how feasible it is in the possibility, but I like the idea of it in a sense. Yeah, uh, I've, I saw a lot of really great games in the era of what we call uh, interactive fiction. Again, this is early 80s where you had uh, games like Zork or whatever, which were actually text adventures. And, and uh, you would type, uh, go north. Yeah. And it would read back to you and then say, kill dwarf or something like that. So it was always a uh, verb noun, verb noun. Mm -hmm. And then they started adding pictures to those. And then some new concepts started coming along and a number of science fiction writers uh, Thomas M. Dish comes to mind as one, wrote a game called Amnesia, which was actually put out by Random House. Uh, and it sadly didn't do well. And the whole idea of interactive fiction by writers who know fiction uh, has sort of fallen by the wayside. On the other hand, now the Nebula Awards give out an award as of this year for game writing. Mm -hmm. So maybe, uh, I think people who are of a generation past me, I was uh, stunned to find out that, uh, yeah, it was Nora's N.K. Jemison. It's like, oh, so how did you get into the field? Were you reading these books or those books? And she said, no, gaming. Mm -hmm. she, she, that's how she got into the concepts of speculative fiction and then began reading the stuff. And now is creating. So that even though I was a gamer and a science fiction slash speculative fiction person, I don't like to pigeonhole anything. Uh, has somehow sort of passed me by. I feel bad about that. I can play the games. I can read the books. I've never quite married them and never quite understood that, yes, people can come into the genre through that. Which brings up the question, how did you get drawn to genre? Fantasy it, and yeah, it, it was writing. I mean, not, not writing. It was reading. It was. And I, uh, I think I'd, I mean, I, I'm always a big, 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 big reader and stuff. I probably read some like you know a lot of the, the classic children's fantasy when I was younger. But I think I, was, I didn't remember specifically picking, seeking out like fantasy and science fiction until I had read of all started reading of all things uh, Anne McCaffrey's Pern books, mm -hmm. the Dragon Rider books. I, it, I the reason That's I read them. Really is, Way books. Those will yeah. bring people in. Yeah, but I only started picking them up because they were the colorful covers in mm -hmm. my library at in the middle school. They had there were stacks. It was in the middle of the library stack. And remember the of the library bookcases. So I always pass them to get to the checkout desk, and they're really brightly colored. And they're right at island. So I was like, these looked interesting. So what are these about? And so I just got one, and I started getting the rest of them. And the funny thing is, I think for about, it, I guess for this whole time I had noticed them, no, the, none of the books ever moved. But until I started reading them, after, not long after that, other people had picked up the books and checked them out as well. Mm -hmm. and 
But anyway, that was my gateway into into fantasy, even though I really did think it was fantasy because you know it was dragons until I realized yeah. later on that it was actually science fiction because of the reveals I had later on in the series. But from there, I got more interested in reading more in that speculative, the speculative fiction area. Yeah. So from there, it's like it's all she wrote. It's like a lot of a lot of my of all the things I of the things I still read today, I was still geared, I still lean towards fantasy more and science fiction more than all the other other genres. Even though I do read, try to read as much broadly as possible. Yeah, it was always a good thing. Uh, who are some of the other writers that you've been reading then or now? I guess I'll start with the now, since that's more recent in my mind. No, Rebecca Rowan Horses is a big one. I think I read I read Black Sun recently. I was like, that's everything I ever wanted in epic fantasy. Yeah. Like it was so good I can I can wait for the second one. I had so digesting what happened in the first. I have an interview here. I'll have to do that. I'll yeah. see if I can find an in. <laughs> um let's see P P Delgi Delgi Clark sure. as well. Yeah. yeah. Uh yeah, I love his novellas is like he does so well in short fiction, I'm envious of, of it because I always have the tendency to overwrite. And he said, see, that's like a plot of a very vivid, really vivid world in such a short amount of pages that I saw I'm left wanting to see more of this stuff. So I'm really happy that this first, first full novel is novel, coming out this year. So I can't wait to read. Um, Although I like the fact that he works with different lists. I'm a big fan of, well, epics. I can run. Mm -hmm. Uh, God knows how many thousands of pages, but I'm also a big fan of, you know, th things that can run 16 or 60 pages. They each offer different things. And P. Jelly Clark has just uh, sort of mastered the novella. Yeah, it's like the, because I wasn't really a big fan of novellas before. I think I really picked up, started picking up his books. I think I only really pick, I picked up most because it's just like the concepts he had for it. Like, it looked just the premise looked interesting. But after that, I got, I had more respect for the novella afterwards. Like seeing how, like the, how much you can do with you can do with it, basically. Yeah, I mean the the, the problem with it all, of course, is the market. Mm -hmm. Publishers want novels. I, I I do know reader more readers have been talking about like shorter stuff now. I guess especially it's a lot of since the big doorstopper novels, but it's such a thing for all these years and long running series that keep going on and on that there's people want more, I guess less of a commitment basically. They want to something to be more, I've been hearing readers saying they want more standalones. They want more shorter stories basically. Yeah, and, and that's something the internet has helped with as well because in the era of science fiction where I was reading it, the gateway were the magazines, Galaxy mm -hmm. Magazine, yeah. Amazing Stories, uh, Analog, and uh, the Magazine of Fantasy and Science Fiction, etc. And now you have the internet. Now, and the internet allows any length. So that's where you get things like Clark's World and um, the three podcasts that, that uh, I'm associated with, with uh, for John Joseph Adams, who's publishing, what, a dozen short stories every month yeah. between the three magazines and uh, his anthologies. And... Uh, He's been doing novels through John Joseph Adams' books. And uh, uh, the short story is, and the novella and these forms are very much alive. Um, and there are also a few people breaking media rules in what they do like Andrea Hairston creating works that have to have music. Mm -hmm. And uh, Kat Valenti has done that as well in collaboration. For some reason, it seems to work better with fantasy than with science fiction. I don't know why. I guess fantasy is more anything kind of goes. I think 
So then there's a lot of science fiction. There's so more like you want to be somewhat grounded a bit than before I compare the fantasy, I guess. I guess or at least fantasy has allowed more. If you want to hear it since it's you're describing things that are, it's hard to, to say. So having like a, an audio, something audio kind of helps out a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm being an audio person. I'm always going to be happy to hear that. Uh you mentioned that you do UX, which in my day we simply called interface design. Uh, what kind of UX do you do? I, yeah, I'm basically on, on the, mostly on web, a little bit on apps because we my website work for does have the, the double has, has a, a really a really strong app press. Well, not strong. I have a really dedicated app app present for certain things. But it's kind of mostly just working as just a typical website is making it, things a little bit better, like making things easy for users to find. Um, screen uh, clothes. Yeah, screen clothes. I just, I just also just be able to find certain things, like, you know, just whether to find the lead form we have on the site, so find information. Um, a lot of sometimes it's just collecting information about the visitors to the site as, as themselves, like whether uh, it's from demographic stuff to things that are interested in finding, uh, defining their user journeys, basically, because there's like different, several different journey, user journeys that people can make on the site and kind of figure out what those could be to kind of better serve them and figure out certain products. And yeah, there's a bunch of little things like that. It's, kind of, it's always kind of fun. And it's one that's a feel that it kind it's of came from. Yeah. There's sort of a gaming aspect to that. Yeah, it and is. I mean, there's a lot of, yeah, there's a lot of things that, I mean, there's, Especially when you look at some of the metrics for a month, it's like it's a, it's a, it doesn't have a, the gaming the aspect does come up a bit. You get a, some you get a, get a certain pleasure of seeing uh, people actually are finding the you know the button or the this page that we want them to find. It's just seeing the numbers go up or down depending on certain things is always kind of fun. Now speaking of uh, websites and stuff, you have a very nice one. Mm -hmm. We should just tell people. Uh, uh, it's Nicole, Nicole Glover, dash Glover dot com. You see, there's the UX in radios that you have to say <laughs> dash. So it's N I C O L E hyphen G L O V E R dot com. You can figure out the, the dot com for yourself, listeners and viewers. Um, does your background in psychology? interact I, with the UX experience and your writing and? Oh yeah, all, all the way around. I think I got interested in psychology because I liked to write. Because I've always been a, a writer since I was younger. And so I was always interested in what, why people did certain things. Uh, you know, why they, like what, what they're thinking basically. So so when I, I guess when I went to school, off the school, like you know, psychology felt like a really good fit. And, and definitely UX, yeah, it's, it's psych with UX, psychology is basically, you know, it's a, it's a marriage of UX, the marriage of psychology, art, and computers. And so it was a, it was, it was one of the kind of funny, I guess, kind of stumbled into UX as a field by accident. Like I just read the book and I was like, oh, this is a, that I was talking about kind of user in interfaces and all this other design stuff. And like, this is actual field with computers. Like, why didn't I learn about this when I was in college? Mm -hmm. And from there, yeah, but yeah, definitely psychology is a thing. I, I'm, I'm always curious about why people do certain things, and yeah, I think that it's, that's the kind of the approach I take with like with writing, like you know, like a lot, a lot of times to figure out like why why people are doing that, what are you thinking, like how what your actions are, and all that all this other stuff just fascinates me. Yeah, and to me, this is all coming together into who you are because. You've got a background in psychology and user experience, this interest in um, the, the antebellum era and magic, and it all ties together very nicely. And it's almost a shock that I don't think I've ever encountered anything quite like it before. And it's just so easy to pick up and go through. And by the way, uh, how much of this, I mean, it's not been done that I can think of offhand period. And especially not uh, in black literature. I 
<laughs> I, I, one should point out these books are readable by anybody yeah. and everybody. Uh, it's yeah, it's good to hear. It's, I don't know. It's always felt like a. I think especially with all the different genres and mashing up together, it's like oh, this is probably a lot. Because I always felt like when I started like you know pitching out to people, like you know describing like give you a, a quick summary of what it is. I'm like oh, it's a, it's a historical fantasy like murder mystery. And I feel like that's a lot of words. It's all because of all these different genres clashing together. But each you know each genre like it counts. I make sure that each I have emphasis on each genre in there, and you know it's. I don't know. I don't know if it's the first. There's probably a lot. There's lots. I mean, there's always there's lots of books I haven't read out there that maybe it's kind of tackled some similar things. But I, you know, you know, I'm sure that there's something in what what I don't know, and I'm fairly well read, yeah. but uh, especially in the genres. But what I don't know, I'm I'm sure there's a listener out there who can tell us something. Or if you're viewing this on Facebook or something, you know, type in. Uh, an example, but to me, this was unique. That's what got me from the pitch that I was sent by your publicist. So uh, I, I, I'm so glad that I did. And you notice th that I'm just saying your books, because <laughs> I, I th I'm living in my head in a future where you've got this empire of stuff. Yeah, I mean, I got enough. I got enough ideas for that. I think it's it's funny when I remember busy because I, I think I had a when I was editing and like working the second book, I had started writing a list of all the ideas I had like for different stories on the side because that's what happens when you're busy with something. You get a bunch of ideas for a new project, and so you know, I think I had like a nice little healthy list of things I wanted to write, things I wanted to need to research basically, and you know, I. I guess I always, I mean, I always wanted to be a writer from a kid, I think, in the sense that I always, you know, once I realized that's a job you could do as being an author and, you know, there's people who write the books I read, they are the actual real people. So, like, you know, my desire was as a kid, you know, had my name in the book somewhere. And I think I always imagined several lists, uh, several books, you know, because I think I used to make lists of like a, I was really good at like making titles and series. When I started like my little, my little stories I did as a kid. I remember I had a print, I made a printout of like potential titles for you know, books I never wrote, <laughs> but had ideas for. And it was like, it was like at least maybe a, two pages of stuff of, of this titles of, of potential book ideas. So like I always have a dream of lots of books in the future. Just, you know, I'd have to find the time to write them all. Uh, now, now we've established that this is a very rich universe. Mm -hmm. that you're not going to be abandoning very quickly, but I'm wondering if there are other universes or one shots mm -hmm. Or things that you have in mind that you might get around to tackling. Yeah, I mean, definitely, I did want to write a, a kind of secondary world kind of story. You know, it's more, mm -hmm. more, more lines of epic fantasy in the sense that I can at least more I can like go f have free, uh, less structured like magic and just do whatever I want kind of thing. You know, it's like more like a not really tied. So I won't be tied to like the history and stuff. But it's like in some ways it, it is like it is a box to be careful on. But I want to have, you know have kind of run around and have fun with that. And I think I eventually want to do like a a space opera in a sense, you know, it's like more of a space thing. I've always been big on space. And I guess, I don't know, I guess between like watching this new Star Wars and the like Expanse series and stuff like that, I wanted, I was interested in like, you know, do something in space, even though I haven't really said, been, I guess I mostly want to do more, try to do a little bit more with science fiction. I did a lot of my stories have been fantasy. And I think, and also, you know, have fun with a uh, more contemporary, realistic fiction, of course, you know, just to, because there's a different, there's different stakes when you're writing more realistic fiction mm -hmm. than where, you know, with fantasy and science fiction, you know, with fantasy, you know, the world's ending, or there's this magic bad guy at the stop, or, you know, this particular spell that's going awry in your life. Whereas, you know, realistic fiction has more, I mean, they, they have like big stakes that seem on the outside small stakes, but it's like a different, I think is I guess well I guess most because it's more about character stuff that's interesting character work that's be kind of kind of kind of fun to pull back on, and just to kind of mess around and you know as I think I guess I got I don't know if I'll do like a traditional mystery at all I think I think all my mysteries will probably be the magical mystery vein of like doing it because that's, that's lots of fun and stuff but who knows yeah like, if there's anything it's like anything it's pretty much anything catch my interest I probably want to try to write. I think I find a lot of things end up writing are things that they interest me or things I dislike and want to make my own spin on or things that 
I want to that they're doing and I wanted to make my own like stamp put my own trademark stuff on but yeah I I, I can see that I, th I think this is a wonderful start mm -hmm. uh, and I wish you the best with it I, I think it'll get it. we should mention uh what the the official publication date probably is passed by the time we get to broadcast uh it's is it march 2nd yes march 2nd in, in the u.s and for any uk just listeners it's out on the the third of the march march 4th so yeah let, and let me uh mention uh to viewers and listeners if you go to uh cold-lover Dot com you can see the cover of the UK edition of the book and it's very interesting how different it is and yet uses similar um, icons in you know, that one would associate I guess with the Underground Railroad uh, but uh, very different types of art both of them very expressive yeah, it's, I think it's interesting, interesting to me too. I've heard that that was going to get, well, I got, so I never thought I was going to actually have it be published out in the UK. I just thought it was going to be US only. You know, I think I'm very history, like, you know, it's like, it's not going to appeal to people outside of the US, but I got excited when I heard about the UK version, especially when they got to have a new cover. Cause I always know new covers are like, you know, collecting things. It's like, it's always fun. So I started looking up, like, I guess I was got curious looking at differences between the US and UK covers. And this is actually a, a big deal. Like I saw, I came across a few blogs talking about differences of different, of different that became different between different countries, the two different countries. And I think some of it's like, you know, market-based, though it can get interest and stuff. But I was just intrigued by how like the different interpretation of certain themes come out differently, whether it's in the US or UK. And just, you know, it's just, it's, it's, I guess I like the designs of like looking at stuff, so. It'll be really interesting to see if this gets any uh, foreign language yeah. versions and not only how will the translation be, but what will the cover look like? What yeah. will the imagery look like? Yeah, definitely. I, I, don't, I haven't heard anything about that yet, but I'm definitely, it's one of the things I would like, like to see. Getting himself the foreign translation is always kind of fun. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's also yes, it's also accessibility for like uh, different countries as well. Because I think I don't think until I got into plugged into the publishing that I didn't realize the difference is worldwide how people get books is vastly different than I'm used to. They don't have as not many people have really good library systems like that I have here around. So it's like it's different. So, but yeah, anyway, I'd be very fascinating to see when any kind of international covers come out one day. And of course, I'll have them displayed on my website because it's the thing I like to do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I think we can wrap up. Is there anything you want to, anything I haven't asked, anything you want to talk about? I think we covered a lot. I would think of it. It had lists and it could cover a lot that was on there. Yeah. So I guess at that point, at this point, uh, I'll just say thank you so much for doing this. Um, and again, for everybody, the name of the first book in the series is The Conductors. The author is Nicole Glo Glover. I don't know why I want to say Glover. It's wrong. Glover. G-L-O-V-E-R. And... Um, available wherever better books are sold yeah. and audiobook. Yeah. So uh, again, thank you very much. It was fun talking. Good. Take care. Have a good day.